Okay, so welcome again, everyone. And uh, we do have a, a message to share uh, related to a journey to reconciliation. Um, we really do want to begin and start off from a position of responding to calls to action for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, which includes calls to action um, that acknowledge, respect, understand, and celebrate Indigenous histories, cultures, and ways of life. Today, we're sharing an excerpt from the oral tradition, which be, can be found in the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada. The Métis. Okay, so welcome again, everyone. And uh, we do have a, a message to share uh, related to a journey to reconciliation. Um, we really do want to begin and start off from a position of responding to calls to action for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, which includes calls to action um, that acknowledge, respect, understand, and celebrate Indigenous histories, cultures, and ways of life. Today, we're sharing an excerpt from the oral tradition, which be, can be found in the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada. The Métis, like other Indigenous peoples, pass their histories, legends, and family remembrances down through the oral tradition. Throughout the Métis Nation homeland, the intergenerational transmission of culture occurred through the oral tradition, usually through elders or the old people, as they are traditionally known. Probably the best known aspect of the oral tradition is the telling of stories. All traditional Indigenous stories, including Métis ones, generally have non-linear narratives and unlike European stories, many of them have no real beginning, middle or end. Métis stories are often ongoing and can be carried over through time. The stories are layered and have multiple meanings, so people of varying ages will be left with different interpretations. Valuable life lessons are taught in the Métis oral tradition. For instance, a story about gluttony may be told through a humorous Wizakichak, the trickster story. Today, we're sharing lessons from our own stories, our own lived experience, uh, caring and loving young people and uh, with mental health concerns. And, and we often share with one another orally, like we're doing a bit tonight, and we'll do more so in, in our part two session. Um, and so as we do so, let us honor the oral tradition that continues with the Métis and other Indigenous peoples throughout Turtle Island. Thank you for being our slide advancer to Vicky. <laughs> right on target so far. <laughs> Um, so yes, tonight's session about finding balance when parenting young adults with mental health concerns. Um, and young adults, there's different definitions of that age range, but I think we kind of count those middle to late adolescent years, teen years, all the way up until, um, you know, probably in, in the range of where my oldest son is now. Um, and uh, those young and emerging adult years, especially when we think that the brain, the young brain does not fully mature until around age 25. Um, and I don't know about others here, but I was a parent to two, two children before my brain was fully ready. And, uh, and so much more makes sense with that understanding. We kind of introduced ourselves. <laughs> Which we did. All right, Jen, you want to take it from here? Okay, so um, let's see, are we, we're going to talk about um, seven tips from our families to yours, and they're not in any particular order. Um, number one is self-care, because it's our oxygen mask, right? Uh, number two, we're going to talk about learning, unlearning, and relearning skills. And number three, listening and validating. Number four, moving to the advocacy seat. Number five, building connections. Six, self-reflection for connection. And number seven, letting go to grow. Okay. So self-care, because we matter, right? Um, we are resilient creatures. We can have personal growth, positive relationships, self-awareness, positive emotions. Um, you know, having a positive lifestyle habits can be tricky sometimes because we are stressed 
and we tend to put ourselves on the back burner per se. Um, but definitely if we can incorporate a proper diet with a little bit of exercise, perhaps some good sleep, you know, try to keep a positive mood or mindset. Um, and it's so very difficult when you're in the moment to try to have that positive mindset, but it is, it is possible to have, um, and we also, you know, if you can try to omit the feelings of guilt, self guilt, um, we tend to be harder on ourselves. Um, and our youth can be very, very hard on us too. So it's, it's so important that we do take care of ourselves um, while we are going through this difficult journey. I think one of the things that uh, around the, the self-care piece is that as much as we would probably remember when our kids were, were little or the, the young people in our lives were much younger, we're much more aware, I think, sometimes of that we are, you know, our child's first teacher. We are a model that they see and how we attend to our needs is what they're likely to absorb um, you know, subconsciously about what's important about how to take care of ourselves. And if we know that they do better when they've got balance in their life and they're doing the things that they enjoy as well as the things that they don't enjoy so much, then being able to model that and ask for their support in that, I have found uh, to be something that was a, a surprise and a pleasure as the kids got older and into young adulthood, especially in the pandemic where, you know, we were all kind of worn down. And I would have to say that um, uh, our kids at that point were were probably the the leaders on the self-care side and were able to to kind of be a bit of a barometer for, for me um, and, and remind me that, you know, I, I got to walk the talk too and if I'm gonna be like did you what time did you go to bed at last night they're gonna very much get the hang of being like well well mom what time bed did you go uh what time did you go to bed last night and um and and that sometimes uh, it kind of creates this kind of team feeling around attending to our well-being and not just always trying to get things from being in a rough place to a neutral place but instead when we're in a more neutral place actually getting us to a, a, a that better positive place as Jen was saying where we can have a bit more of an optimistic outlook and feel like there's as many good things maybe happening as the things that are hard um, and and that kind of fills fills our, our, our cup up as that last uh, image showed a little bit that in order for us to water the, the plants, we got to have that source of water for ourselves. Oh, the and this was a, yes. Yeah, so this was a great diagram um, that we came across. Uh, try seven types of rest. And, you know, there can be physical rest where you can catch 40 winks or just, you know, have some quiet time to yourself, a little bit of a mental rest, um, sensory rest, which might be difficult for all of us because we seem to live on our cell phones and our laptops. And, you know, we definitely need to take a break once in a while from that, as well as a bit of a social rest. Um, there also is spiritual rest, emotional rest, and creative rest. So there's different sorts of outlets that, um, you know, if you are creative, you might get some paints or if you just want to color or, you know, do those sorts of things or maybe grab a good book and have a bubble bath if you can. Lock the bathroom door so nobody can disturb you. And even if you get a chapter in or even a couple of paragraphs, even one paragraph, right? That's one more than you possibly um, than you would have started with. So just a great visual for us just to remember to be kind to ourselves. I remember an activity that was uh, suggested at something I was at one time where, you know, to brainstorm a list of things that you can do that are kind of, you know, rejuvenating for you that might be about rest, that might be about self-care, that might be about, um, you know, restoring yourself to some equilibrium in all the, the different domains, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. Um, and they so you brainstorm the list and then you 
you organize it based on activities you can do in one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, you know, a block of time, like a half a day or something like that, or a whole day or weekend. Um, and because I know for me and our family, an hour sometimes felt impossible to to create because we have a number of children and, and, and other people in our family. And so um, the there was always just someone else whose whose needs we could support, and uh, and when I thought about it that way, it stopped feeling like I was also failing at self care, and because I would have that list of things I'd like to do, and I'd never be able to make the time to do it, and um and it really was more about how I'm doing it, not so much you know trying to carve that time out. It was about starting something small and those many little one minute or five minute ones over a period of time of a day, a week, uh, you know, a little bit of a few weeks, then that kind of added up and seemed to have more of an impact for me because I was choosing to do it. It was a more mindful, intentional instead of the escape where, you know, you're hiding, you're like, I hope they don't find me. I'm just going to eat the chocolate bar right now. <laughs> It's definitely self-care for me. Um, and uh, just being able to say that I made a decision that was about prioritizing myself, no matter how small the piece is, uh, really made a difference. I see someone meant a tea becoming a lifeline. Yes, hot chocolate for me, smelling it, tasting it. Oh, yes, the warm mug, especially in the colder months. Uh, just sitting in a in a pool of sunshine in the in the warmer months, I'm starting to see that that coming. The spring is coming. I'll we'll start this one too, Jen. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I think my slides are just a little out of sync. One second here. Okay. So the learning, uh, always learning, forever learning. Always learning. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, do to do, do. Sorry, I'm just. And we had talked. Did about we do the, the umbrella? That's the one we're looking at right now. Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. So um, another fabulous diagram or, or, um, to show that, you know, there are so many different diagnoses and we're continuously learning whether we've just gotten a new diagnosis or perhaps there's something different or concerning behaviors you're worried about. But we tend to uh, go to Google and do some research to find out, you know, is this something that's possible? Uh, you know, should we call the doctor? Um, and if there is a diagnosis, we like to read upon it and, and learn uh, coping strategies and different skills that can help us and our youth. Uh, there's also community supports where you can, you know, learn through different therapies, um, you know, learning about adult development, how different it is, and, um, and learning about the youth's perspective, which is fascinating. I am always intrigued by hearing when the youth speak, you know, um, and they share their feelings and, and their expectations. Um, so about the coping strategies and skills, have you learned any in the past? Perhaps we could circle back and relearn or practice those skills. Sometimes we forget that we already learned certain things. And for community services and supports, are there services and supports available for our youth? Are there wait lists? Is there an age cap or what is the age availability? Are there funding available or options for these services? So there's all kinds of different aspects of learning. Um, and Louise, you were going to add some more? Yeah, because I think when we're talking about the, you know, the young adult and, and hitting that 18th birthday, if our young person is already connected to services and, and accessing some mental health supports, then there's a whole transition there. And if they're they're not, then you know being aware of what some of the access points are where in your community or where online that you know is less about geographic region and more about you know virtual opportunities um you know getting connected in there to support 
them because we definitely lose that that power that we had when they were younger to be able to make a phone call and 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 connect our kid to some supports um once they're over 18 it's a very different story and that can be really un unsettling and we can feel powerless of course um but also it changes our role and we're going to talk about that a little bit more um but understanding what stuff is out there helps us be able to support our our child because then um we can kind of navigate it together and become a team in that way of just exploring i know with with one of the young people in my family um you know i i just was cleaning some papers up the other day and came across you know the referral form it's a self referral form for a, a program in our community and i'm like ah i've got a post it note stuck on it you know give to so and so and i know i gave them a copy and i'm like yeah let me know when you want to look at this we can sit down and fill it out together or give them a call and ask some questions and um and just seeing it again I'm, i was reminded that i didn't make time to follow up with that uh that young person about that and and i think that's where you know some of those things that we may make assumptions about as they become adults and they're doing a lot more themselves the things that they still need support in or needed support in a few years ago they probably still need support in that and maybe more so now um because that adult development stage that they're at um often you know in through these later years it could be they're at that fairly tough time they may be finishing high school and looking at some other transitions in life and and just feeling kind of stressed out and and that means that sometimes they're fully able to make decisions and reason and um you know feel comfortable in their their skin as a as a young adult and other times they're going to have that developmental kind of stepping back and and hope that someone can step in and 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 support and take care of them and being able to kind of go with that flow you know you get a little bit of whiplash on it sometimes <laughs> um but being able to kind of read where they're at and be able to 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 meet them where they are and be able to to come in and support more when they need that and to step away when they when they need that less um around their own mental health concerns uh i think is one of the things that um we're really well suited to be able to do as we move into that that sidecar so to speak um because we can kind of present information and and support them in exploring and making decisions and and yes the uh what you'd put in the chat Vicky about being able to step out of worry and into curiosity and be able to share that as a as that's part of the connection that you can make in in your relationship with them is to let's be you know curious together and um and that's of course not without many ups and downs still and that's why i added the youth perspectives on there because within our own families there's always that that dynamic that will exist um you know we have a history with our kids we're not always our best we're not always our second best i think sometimes and um and that can be hard because they know us at our most vulnerable as we know them at their most vulnerable and uh and so sometimes that makes it hard to to kind of share our our deep most feelings and and worries and to to learn how to do things better with each other and um i found i ended up following a whole bunch of young people's accounts on i think instagram where they were talking about mental health and you know advocacy and just issues related to being a young person in the world we live in today and sharing information and things like that and being able to follow those perspectives allowed me totally to be without judgment and be in a space where i could learn about things that maybe stuff that my young person or the young people in my life were experiencing or curious about or worried about or wondering uh you know what to do with in in social settings or you know making life decisions and career pathways and things like that and it it kind of took some of the pressure off that i could learn from this space where no one had any expectations of me i didn't have any expectations for myself and 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 bring some of that stuff so then i would just kind of send some posts over to my kids <laughs> and see what they did and oh wow i didn't know this is this something you know that that you've noticed and um that ended up being a bit of a, a bridge as well and allowed 
them to see me as someone willing to learn instead of someone who felt like they always had the answers and knew exactly what they should be doing. Um, oh, I did want to just mention the last point on there to that learning continuously about the impacts of our upbringing, our own culture, our traditions and worldviews, because uh, every family is going to be different. Um, we do have different backgrounds. Um, uh, my kid's dad is Chinese, so they identify fully with being Chinese. And um, and so we have a lot of different ways of, of looking at things and, and you know, the role of that family plays. And so all of that will be different in, in your family and understanding how we bring those expectations and those things subconsciously to our, our kids in the world that they're growing up in, which may be different. Okay, sorry. Yes. Go ahead and move along. Okay, and this, although there's a lot of text on this slide, I this is more that'll be helpful for later. We'll, we will share the slides. Um, this was the life-changing learning that that I had that has served me well for mm, 2015, 2001. So 23 years now is when I first learned about collaborative problem solving. And that was a tool that's brought us through many, many, many ups and downs with many members of the family, not just uh, young people. Um, and nonviolent communication, I, I learned that as well, and I'm just continuously learning about that. And, and that allowed me to understand how to identify feelings, but what needs they're connected to, and to be able to have conversations from that that position and instead of um, having conversations or trying to problem solve with uh, the young adults in the family around what I wanted, I could instead frame it from what I needed and be curious about what they were needing and how could we possibly, you know, find some strategies that might might meet my needs and your needs or siblings needs. Um, and those that tool has just been un, unendingly helpful, as well as in the more recent years, emotion focused family therapy or EFFT, which is um, becoming a lot more widespread in clinical approaches. And um, that was a lot about emotion regulation and validation of, of whoever is in your life. Um, and those three things uh, there is a ton of free resources available online and we'll make sure that stuff gets shared out. But what was common in all three of those is how to do a redo. When we make mistakes, because we do and we will, um, uh, being able to to go back and say, oh, you know what, I didn't like how I said that. Or last week when things all fell apart, I think I didn't help that. And being able to go back and make those repairs, make those apologies and find a place to do that redo uh, really were, were huge things uh, that helped um, support relationships in, in our family. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Vicki. All right, Jen, how are you oh. doing with the slides there? Oh, good, good. I yeah. apologize if the dogs are barking in the background. <laughs> um. I don't hear a thing, sounds good. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. So listening and validation. Um, and these skills take lots of practice. And if you have had the opportunity to do some EFFT or um, collaborative problem solving, you learn about validation. And what we strive to do is validate our loved ones. And it's not just for children or youth. Um, I've used validation for my aging parents or perhaps my sibling. Um, so it's a skill that you can use in many different situations. And it's important too, that we validate ourselves, that we are trying to, you know, to do the best we can in this moment. We're not worrying about tomorrow, trying not to worry about yesterday. It's in this moment. And we like to give ourselves credit where credit is due. Um, and the judgments and power struggles are always a, a challenge. And it's really hard to try to stop those. I think sometimes when you're so used to um, having an argument with 
our loved one and someone's always got to have the last and final word um, and have that power struggle. It's, it's difficult to just stop. It's like we have to unlearn our some other skills. So we'll talk about unlearning things um, in a few slides. But if we can switch our negative to the positive, um, this diagram, it was another great example. Um, if our youth is bossy, maybe they like to be in charge. Maybe they want to be a leader. So these are skills that some folks might see as negative, but we can flip them into a positive. And even if we have a small positive in each day, whether it's your youth came home early, um, they helped unload the dishwasher, or they were kind and didn't swear, celebrate those little um, positives. And I know in our house, swearing is a big, big issue, language. And, and I hear, you know, when they're speaking to friends, the friends are speaking in the same way. So I've found enough, um, I call courage to just stop that language, because I don't, I don't want to hear swearing and every other word. Um, so it, it's very difficult in unlearning, but we can do it. And um, so yeah, these are great skills that uh, can be switched and those will be on um, the slides for later and anything else you wanted to add Louise I think the the power struggles part of it I think um and we'll talk about this on the self-reflection all this stuff is just going to circle you know go circular yeah. back around so um I, I had to really think about that because one of our kids, we had lots and lots of challenges around um, uh, power struggles and what was labeled defiance then. And now I look at very, very, very differently. And by actually seeking to understand their perspective and be curious and and, and do the validation in that really deep way and actually show commitment to wanting things to feel just as right for them as I wanted them to feel for me um, it kind of brought us together a little bit. And I realized that in our patterns, because that's often what it is, it's the patterns we get into. It's not so much that they have problems or they're not doing the right thing, or even that we have problems or we're not doing the right thing, but these patterns that we get into. And being able to look at the pattern as being the challenge took away the judgment from the people and saying, oh, you know, we, we've kind of got stuck in this, this rut. And instead of it being something that feels like a judgment on the person or on even on their behavior, it's just these things, these other things that take on a life of their own that are far more changeable and that we can both put energy and attention to and talk about it with a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a bubble of space around our own vulnerabilities so that uh, it doesn't feel like we're, you know, in opposition to each other, but instead we're side by side looking at this third thing. And, um, and I, was able to then see how many of our past power struggles were actually ones I initiated. <laughs> I'm like, I win. I'm the one that started it. I got there first. And then, no, that wasn't helpful. And, and because I was always willing to show how what I thought should happen would be the better way. And my parents do tell me I've had that challenge my entire life. Um, <laughs> that you know i've always felt like i know i know this is what we should do this is this is the right thing and and the child that we had the most challenges with is also like that so they're you know it wasn't the oil and water it was the oil and oil because we were the same and um and wow we could get into some pretty good debates and and that's when i realized oh our children are smarter than we are <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do that anymore and, and, and feel like I could come out even. So uh, being able to shift that 
judgment from ourselves or our child to something else that's not a judgment, just more observations and just being like, okay, I've noticed that when, you know, when you're up late, then this happens with me. And then we both seem to get grumpy and then the day doesn't go so well. Um, it was just sharing observations. And, uh, and that really took a lot of the tension out and there was no handholds for the power struggles. Oh, the advocacy oh, seat. Yes. Yes. This, yes. Well, <laughs> I learned how to advocate right from the get go when my son was two, um, all the way through till grade 12. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, we try to, to get our, our young people to learn how to advocate for themselves, but sometimes it's most difficult and they can't. Um, and I find I'm still advocating, even though he's almost 20, um, not as much as I used to. But, um, you know, our system can be a challenge, most definitely. And it's definitely broken as well. And sometimes you have to speak up. And I always said the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, just being persistent and keeping on on top of things. School supports are available for our young folks if they are in college or university or perhaps they are still in high school. Um, now getting them to accept that support might be another challenge, um, but at least you know we can try to get the support that they deserve. Um, our communities are growing like crazy, and I know there's a shortage of family doctors, so sometimes you might not have a family doctor or you need to advocate to find one. Um, and if your youth is on that verge of, you know, transitioning to adulthood and their psychologist or psychiatrist will only see them until they're 18, then you have to get a, another referral Um for them to see an adult psychiatrist. So that could be a challenge as well. But again, another advocacy um, spot to keep an eye open for. And another little thing is for medication. Some folks are on medication, some aren't. But the cost and coverage of medication can be a challenge. Um, again, advocating for coverage. There's a trillium drug benefit. Uh, there's ODSP, there's different options that can cover those uh, prescription drugs. So there's all kinds of different seats, you know, when you can advocate for or from. And sometimes it'll feel like it's a full time job, right? Just trying to cover all your, your, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's and it's, it's exhausting. It truly is, but if you can stick to it, then the outcome will be hopefully a positive one for you guys. I Anything part, else to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that part of that moving to the advocacy seat is kind of that reference that we're not in the driver's seat anymore. And, um, uh, you know, depending on the, the relationship that we have with the young people in our life, we may have a we may be more of the back seat. It might be like a stretch limo, probably a school bus, and we're at the back. <laughs> um, and sometimes we are kind of in that that side seat next to them, and uh, able to support them as they're doing things. And sometimes uh, what we're maybe supporting and advocate advocating for um, feels like we want to be in like the driver's ed car, where we also have our own steering wheel and our own controls, and they can have theirs too. And um, because where they may be going may not be where we would like them to go. And um, and sometimes that, that advocacy seat is a lot about learning some timing. And, um, you know, uh, we actually had a parent in our, our PCMH group meeting um, 
uh, just last week that reminded us, uh, also a parent of a, of a young adult, um, reminded us of the of some of the, the things that are helpful to remember before you say something. You know, is it kind? Is it honest? And is it necessary? And and she shared that it was the necessary part that always seemed to trip her up with, with, with her young adults. And uh, I was like, yes. Wow, just thinking about it that way, kind, honest, necessary. Um, and and I think the timing has a lot to do with that. You know, there it may be, it may feel necessary to us, but if it's not going to be perceived as that by our young person, then we're probably uh, going to be, uh, that's going to be uh, kind of adding up as a, as a negative or a less positive interaction. And we always want to be mindful of that. And, um, and I think I have that in my notes somewhere about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ideal ratio of five positive interactions to one negative interaction for a healthy relationship or healthy attachment. And that's from research by, from uh, the Gottman's through the Gottman Institute. And, um, uh, and if you ever just take a, a, a piece of scrap paper and back of an envelope and track that with various people in your life, um, it's pretty um, amazing how I found with the young adults in my life because they didn't need as much, you know, interaction time. You know, I didn't need to help as much with homework or I didn't need to, to sit down and play games with them and, um, uh, you know, have hands-on activities with them as much. And I noticed that the types of interactions we tended to have were a lot more of the functional stuff. You know, have you switched your laundry? Uh, where's uh, Did you load the dirty dishes yet? Have the, have the dogs been out? All these kinds of things that were more these transactional aspects of life where it's just an exchange of information. And I found a a lot of those things that I was initiating could very easily be perceived as as a negative because it wasn't really about them. It was like an expectation or felt like a demand um, on them instead of things like, hey, you know, um, did you catch the, you know, the most recent episode of that show that you really like? I, I noticed that there's a lot of chatter on, you know, Snapchat or whatever about that. Um, and uh, you know, these connecting interactions versus these other things that maybe kind of tire us out a little bit. Um, and, uh, and having that, that awareness uh, really changed things for me. And I also learned that my kids get suspicious of me. They're like, you're doing different things. What's going on? <laughs> but they don't say that to me. They just look at me as though they're being suspicious. <laughs> In our family, we don't talk about things. That would be difficult. Um, and uh, and I think that's normal for lots of families. But the uh, that being suspicious, I learned that it's more helpful if I just tell them. And I just say, okay, you know what? I've been counting the number of interactions we've had and how many feel positive to me or negative to me. And I wondered, you know, these are the ones I think of. Did this feel positive or negative to you? And and thinking about that in a, in a more outward way uh, was a way to show them that I'm always learning. It, it was a way to you know, engage them in conversations that were about relationships, because for me, and uh, relationships are, are everything. That's how we we function in life. And um, and I, I think going back to the the advocacy seat here, uh, a lot of that was that kind of navigating who's in what seat when. And the last point on the slide about with family and friends, I I learned when I had to advocate with family and friends for my kids or for what my kids believed in. Um, that's probably more of what it was where, you know, in our family, uh, Scottish humor is often like little jabs and, um, you know, never intended to be harmful. Uh, but I've been so impressed with with my parents and their their growth over the years that that they've learned that, you know, sometimes those jabs are, are too sharp. And I remember doing a lot of advocacy around that, um, which wouldn't have been like advocacy. It would it wouldn't have seemed like it, but I understand understand that that's what it was uh, now. And I know that that had a lot of, um, you know, it, that was an investment in the relationship with, with the young people in my life, because they saw me do that. They saw me take that, that burden on so that they didn't have to be like, oh no, the grandpa's at it again, or, or have to, you know, say something back to grandpa themselves. Um, 
that someone else took on that burden for them. And I know that that went uh, a long way. And now that we've got, you know, other young people in our life, you know, partners and um, other family members that are at that uh, stage of life, I see them doing it for each other. And, and that just, you know, gives me lots of warm fuzzies. Time check. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, that's the family and friends part. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yes. Go ahead, Jen. So building connections, this is another important um, topic. Personal, um, building connections for you, the parent, the caregiver. We, again, um, we need to fill our own cups. As difficult as it seems, you know, we're always last, but we need to make ourselves a priority to stay healthy so we can, in fact, support our young youth. Um, and another great idea is to support, find a support group like PCMH. Um, it just is an opportunity. It's a safe space where you can chat, meet new people, maybe share experiences. Or if you don't even want to talk about your situation, you can talk about so many other things. Um, and I'll never forget, we had one meeting where we just watched comedy on YouTube clips and we laughed for over an hour, just belly laughed. And that was, I think the best meeting we had ever had because we didn't talk about the kids. We didn't talk about work. We didn't talk about life. We just focused on what we were watching and uh, it was just the best. We tend to enjoy our meetings in different ways. Um, that was a really good and, one. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, professional connections, which might be a little bit trickier because the age of consent and whether, you know, you're able to talk to the doctor or the teacher or professors, um, but just having the opportunity to maybe introduce yourself and, um, and build that connection. And hopefully they will be, you know, on the receiving end. If you have any questions or concerns, um, and of course, each situation would be different. So when you are building the connections, we like to use active listening. Um, of course, be honest. You can share your emotions and be sure to ask lots of questions and, um, and try to keep your cool. Um, I know sometimes in the moment we can be all fired up and our own emotions can get the best of us. But if we can sort of keep calm and uh, and start that conversation and, and it's an opportunity to build trust as well. I think you covered that super well, Jen. <laughs> Okay, I'm just like trying to fly through them. Sorry. Um, and this one will go a little quicker because I already covered part of this. The for me that that self reflection for connection, I really had to work hard. Uh, I have ADHD myself, and um, I just you know sometimes the manager that's on duty in in lots of people's brains is just on perpetual break in in my brain, and you know I'm always uh, you know prepared to. Uh, you know, intervene or add to something or, um, you know, provide my input in an interaction or something that uh, the the young people in my family are, are doing. And I really, really have to work very hard at catching myself and thinking about, you know, what is that saying when I, um, uh, you know, when this is kind of my gut reaction, when this is what, uh, you know, the direction that I'm wondering about, even when it's, you know, when we're in the, the heat of something difficult, or when it's something that's just like, hey, we're, we're, you know, what kind of food do we want to make for dinner tonight? Um, uh, to really kind of check in with myself so that I am remembering to always be conscious of of what burdens that I bring that I'm actually putting on my kids because they know the things that I'm not so good at. And they're going to kind of pick up the slack for me sometimes. And that means that I'm 
adding something that they have to think about. And I think sometimes young people create more distance. And develop, it's developmentally appropriate for them at this age to be creating some difference, uh, distance so that they can kind of individuate and, and, and develop their own identity separate from where they are within the family and, and within their own circle of care, however that family is defined. Um, and uh, I think that when I've noticed that it seems that my kids are maybe making some accommodations for me because they don't quite have the the courage or the skills or feel ready to to give me some feedback that I need to know about how I'm impacting them. Um, uh, I think me doing that self-reflection step and connecting with myself before I'm connecting with them um, helps make sure that I'm doing the work I need to do uh, and and still recognizing that we have so much flexibility and so much grace for making mistakes in life. And that was another research thing. And I can't remember the source of it, but um, we only need to get things right like 30% of the time for it to feel like a trusting relationship to a child or young person. And that means 70% of the time we, you know, we can miss the mark. And, um, uh, and that's actually pretty reassuring uh, to me because that's, that's, you know, that's kind of just where life is at sometimes. And I think we sometimes put pressure on ourselves to try and be, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. And um, uh, not that I gather that kind of data in, in our family is a bit of a gut feeling. Um, but just knowing that, you know, I can do my work so that they don't have to carry it for me and uh, and, and being willing to make those mistakes. Okay. Good. I've already said everything about the, the five to one ratio. And yes, this this one here about loved ones being wired together. Uh, this is directly from EFFT. That is what the emotion focused family therapy and the work of Adele LaFrance talks about. And, and this is very true that people who have strong bonds between them, however many years it is, or whatever our relationship, whether they're biological children or they're adoptive children or foster kids, you know, we do have these strong connections that build um, because we have caretaking roles. And, uh, and I know there's an old quote somewhere that says, do we, do we love the mouths we feed or do we feed the mouths we love? And it's this interesting chicken in an egg that I ponder at times. And I think taking those actions to show care builds the care in regardless. Um, but these the, that being wired together that we kind of are on the same wavelength and what we feel when our kids are thrilled and excited and distressed or angry, uh, they feel that with us too. And so I do try and ask myself some of these questions, especially if I am tuning into where my emotional bar barometer is at. Very much trying to respond rather than react. This was just, you know, Liz Vosling, she has some fantastic things. If you have a chance to go find her her website, there's a, that's the link to one of the particular ones that this one is. But we often think strength is, you know, climbing the mountain and yay, we made it to the top. And um, the strength we should also admire if the words are too small for people to read is is sometimes getting out of the the deep valleys and we're you know to be able to say I did it and we're at the bottom of the mountain um, we need to be able to have that perspective that acknowledges where people are coming from and, and my reflection to this is how often do we see ourselves as being the one who's coming out of the the, the valley and uh, and how often are we reminding and admiring our ourselves for the the paths that we've come and the learning that we've done and the commitment that we're showing um, for the young people in our life as much as if it's them that are in the those tricky spots too okay go ahead Mickey Oh, yes, a lovely quote from Brene Brown about connection is the energy that is created between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment. Um, I think that takes us back to what Jen said earlier about the, the judgment, too. And that's my granddaughter and my grand dog. They're both <laughs> bigger now. <laughs> Um, this was the last tip that I had, and it's, it feels gigantic. Um, the letting go, um, 
I feel like there's a whole different set of muscles that get developed in the letting go as our as the the young people in our care get older and need us less, even if we don't think they do. <laughs> um, and that that letting go makes me think of the uh, it's a bit of a oh, what is that quote? Um, if you really love something, let it go. But now I don't remember why it comes back to you. Um, <laughs> somebody will find that. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but the letting go for for me has almost always been about the shoulds. Uh, what do we think our kids should be doing? And if we let that go, it alleviates a lot of the pressure. Uh, School-related stuff was uh, a huge challenge for a number of people in my family. And... Uh, it took a lot of effort and time to be able to look at them, that young person, where they are in their life, what their needs are, what what's going to give them a sense of well-being, and letting go of all these societal shoulds of, well, they're this age, they should have a job, they should be doing this. What do you mean they don't have any, you know, social relationships or they aren't dating or, you know, there's so many judgments that society gives to young people and it doesn't matter what they're doing, there's going to be a judgment that'll apply to it, whether they're doing too much of something or too little or too slow or too fast. Um, and so being able to just let go of that and say, what about this child, this young person right now in this moment um, was really freeing, uh, provided a lot of relief to be able to say, oh, that's that's an expectation that's outside of our relationship, outside of our, our circle of care. We don't have to make our decisions based on that we know ourselves best and we can stay connected and we can value our relationship more than we value where we are at, in this arbitrary measurements of society. And, and that's really hard because um, in our family, that meant that uh, school journeys look very, very, very different and uh, and are actually counter to what clinical guidelines are. Um, and and I think that that's important to know that you can always come back to that special relationship that you have, even when the relationship feels very filled with tension, that that connection is there and being able to get back under the tension to that connection and show that they, the person, is more important than, um, you know, whatever definition of success or shoulds is out there and 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 moving into that side side seat so that you can support them and not be the one in charge that's deciding what they should be do or doing or how they should be doing it. Um, I really allowed in, in my youngest child's case, uh, he just showed us how to deal with pandemics. Uh, he was amazing. And um, that will always stand as being a huge lesson to me that this young person who struggled so much and hadn't left the house hardly at all in a very long period of time was not attending school. Uh, he showed us how to, to deal with one of the most stressful things that the world has seen. <laughs> and, um, and I have to trust that, that they're capable of far more than, than I think they, they are. And when I let that go, I'm like, wow, it, it's just amazing to be able to, to sit back and, and realize that sometimes our efforts to support our kids are uh, sometimes actually feel like tethers. And that's where the communication I think is so valuable that we need to stay connected so that we know when, when they need those tethers loosened and when they say, no, hang on to me. And, uh, and to know that, that we're reliable to them when they do need to be held on to. Um, oh, it's one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> yep. I think it kind of speaks for itself that uh, we do learn to make good decisions by actually making decisions uh, and not by following directions. And uh, uh, especially if you have kids with anxiety, um, this really uh, proves true. And if we trust the decisions they're making, even when we're like not sure about those decisions, then, then they learn to trust themselves and then growth looks a little different. That's what we found anyway. <laughs> uh, 
this is kind of my last uh, my last little thing and I didn't even end up being able to articulate it to put words on the slide but the image on the left is an AI generated image when I googled I need a picture of a tugboat on rough waters and some AI website made it for me <laughs> so it's a cardboard tugboat on rough seas um, and I think when our kids are younger and this is how I always saw myself as the tugboat and they're the ocean liner or whatever and we're in the rough seas and I have to be the one that's you know pulling them to safety and through that rough water and I think I learned especially as they got older that I I it's not actually going to help them for me to be the tugboat I need to move over and plant myself on land and be the lighthouse. And I love that in uh, the Mott quote about lighthouses don't go running all over an island looking for boats to save. They just stand there shining. And uh, learning to be the lighthouse, I think, has brought a lot more peace and um, harmony to, to our household. And, and to me, myself, I feel so much better as a parent knowing that I could step back and uh, I just, yeah, just be that lighthouse. I don't know how else to say it. Jen. <laughs> no, yeah, I totally, yes. No, I agree. And um, I guess I'm blessed in some ways when my young person does need help, he's confident enough to come to me and ask, you know, for my opinion or if he needs help booking an appointment or something. So I totally agree. I try to be the lighthouse as well. Um, because in the beginning, I, I think we were all in that boat and we felt like we were sinking and uh, we needed a lighthouse and now we are that lighthouse. Yeah, just a list of stuff. Some of it may be familiar, some of it may not be. Um... There's so much stuff in the Family Care Center that I think still has applicability for, for older kids and young adults. And um, probably there'll be future opportunities to, to, to develop some more if, if there's a need for that. Did I commit you to things there, Mickey? <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. Um, part two of this session is, uh, we're gonna kind of do it as a peer support workshop-y type of session where we can look at actual situations and look at some of these things and some of the things that, that you've learned in your own life that are, are helpful when uh, caring for an older youth or young adult um, and, uh, and kind of practice the the tough things and the good things and, and, and share that knowledge with each other in a, in a more dialogue-based session. That's April 23rd.